Hi, everybody. Good morning from where I'm at. It may be afternoon where you're at. Um, I know the time, when I post the time, it's confusing. It's confusing for me because I live in Arizona. And we're lucky because we don't uh, have to deal with um, daylight savings time. So we stay on the same time all year long, so we switch. So sometimes, like right now, we're on the same time as California. And then in like a month or whatever time change, then we'll be an hour ahead. And then, I don't know, it's very confusing. That's why I live in Arizona, to take away all that confusion. So welcome, everyone. I'm glad to be here. I'm getting, this is day five of my 30-day Facebook Lives. And I have to say, I'm getting less nervous each time when I log on. Still a little bit nervous, but that's okay. Because I have my essential oils that I'll, I'll, I'll keep sniffing throughout it. But, um, okay, so we have a lot to talk about today. Um, more terms around um, narcissistic abuse. The reason that I do this is because that was the um, turning point in my healing and recovery. That's what really uh, started my whole journey is once I started learning the terms and then I could put a name to my pain, a name to my problem, right? Because then, so then I could fix it. Um, but before I start, I want to say to all of you out there who are at, on some part of this journey is that one of the things you're going to find, um, and in the beginning, I wasn't great at handling it. You know, now I can see it for what it is, but I, I was really not good because I was so tender um, when first escaping, but um, some people will react when you start sharing your story. Um, some people will confuse that with, confuse your truth with you either bashing your ex or you're just pissed off and you need to move on, honey. Oh, please, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said that. Um, or uh, yeah, just confusing your um, your your need to finally tell your story and be validated with um, with some sort of vengeance or whatever else. So, for example, um, you know, since I'm a writer and I publish a lot of pieces about this topic, so I get plenty of, and I have to say it's typically from men, and I think that's because um, well, I know it's because. Um, Women, we are trained, right, to, well, first of all, we shouldn't be angry about anything. That's not, that's not very ladylike. And we should be nice. And it's not nice to be angry at people, right? We should be quiet. Um, yeah, all that bullshit. That, uh, so when we do speak out, you know, um, a lot of people will confuse that with our, that we're like, raging, angry, crazy, you know, the whole crazy ex story that only applies to women for some reason. So anyway, so I still get comments to this day that they'll read a piece I wrote and they'll say, wow, you're filled with so much hate and rage and you should really just move on just because I'm telling my story, right? So I just want to validate any of uh, others of you who have heard this. Um, that um that that that's okay they just they just don't know they don't understand you need to just educate them so i educate them and i say frankly i'm no i don't have any hate or bitterness or revenge that's the whole key to healing right we can't heal and recover if we're because that's keeping us in victimhood which is another topic um so 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 i've moved through all that dealt with all that um and the bottom line is that I write and tell my story because I want to fucking tell my story because I was been bullied into silence for like decades. So I just had enough of it. And I'm like, why should I not tell my story? Because if I don't tell my story, all I'm doing is protecting someone else. I'm not protecting me. I'm just hurting myself. Right. So, uh, so you have every right to tell your story and, and, and share your truth if you want to, you know, but anyway, if you get those responses, just to let you know that just, you know, just whatever, just push them over there and just ignore them, right? They, they, they know not what they say. 
Okay, so, um, yes, I will never stop sharing. There, oh my goodness, I can't, you can't even imagine how, like, certain people, oh God, they just wish I would shut up. They're like, God, ugh, is she still talking? Can she just shut up already? Can she just move on? I don't even know what move on means when they say that. I think move on means equals shut up, right? Or if you're going to talk about your past, would you please say something nice? Here's my motto that's not actually my motto. I'm borrowing it. I use it. It's from Anne Lamont, who is a, a fantastic writer. And this is the, her motto is what I live by. If people wanted you to write or talk, speak warmly about them, they should have behaved better. That's how I see it, right? You were very nice. So I'm telling. I'm telling on you, right? I'm tattling on everybody. Anyway, so here I am talking again. Okay, so let's jump in. Um, yes, Trish, we will not be silent. And there is strength in unity that we all raise our voices, especially as women, because we have been silenced for so long. And it's just a cultural expectation that, that you know, that I hadn't even really thought about. But it is. It's a cultural expectation that we are just good. Let's sit over there in the back, right? Don't make a, don't make a thing. Just be quiet and be a good girl, right? Um, that's what, you know, speaking out in any way, oh, my father, oh, my God. Anytime I just even, I always had to agree with him, and I had to, like, I had to, I had to pat his ego like he was a little kid, right? It's like, if I didn't take his advice, or if I didn't, I'm not even talking about arguing, it's like, if I just disagreed with him, right? Uh, or if, or if mainly if I, as an adult, if I stood up for myself, then he called me mean, I was hateful. Anyway, that stuff, it's ridiculous. Um, my first husband, he really likes me to be quiet. <laughs> I mean, I was just a thorn in his side in every single way possible. Um, cause I dared talk sometimes. Um, and the other thing he would always say to me, which will lead to what I've been asking about cussing all the time, because it's just ingrained in me to ask, to check, because my first husband would, he'd always say that I cuss like a sailor, right? And I'm like, if I cuss once in a while, it wasn't like I was going on a rampage of swear words or anything. So he'd say I cuss like a sailor and, um, and that real ladies don't cuss, right? Don't swear. Which is why I love cussing so much, because fuck him, right? That's what I see. Okay, um, let's start. So again, I like talking about these terms because the more you know, then you can do something about it, right? The more empowered you are, right? As with anything in life, right? You educate yourself when you know something, you shed light on it, the darkness goes away, and then you can actually do something about it. And I'm a big advocate for if you don't know what the problem is, you can't fix the problem. So let's name the problem. You know, like yesterday we were talking about gaslighting, which if, if you don't know what that is, like I didn't when I was in my marriage, um, I just thought I was going, I thought I was going flipping crazy. I, I thought I was losing my mind. I thought I was losing my memory. I thought just reality itself was distorted for me. So when I learned the term gaslighting, that it was a, that, that it was a tactic used by narcissists, that just... That just that just freed me from um, that just helped me understand and educate me that I I wasn't crazy first of all which was that's huge like when you're a victim of emotional abuse and you don't know you're a victim of emotional abuse and you think you're the crazy one then somebody comes along and tells you or you educate yourself and find out that you're not crazy that is a huge day like that's that, don't underestimate that that's a huge moment. Um, Okay, so uh, these terms that the definitions is from a piece I wrote in 2015, my first piece, Understand the Language of Narcissistic Abuse, which went viral all over the world because it hit a nerve, right? Because this is key in understanding these terms. So I'm just taking right from my piece. Um, so first, let's talk about 
ambient abuse, <clears throat> ambient abuse. So I'm going to read my definition. Uh, this ambient abuse is the stealthy, subtle, underground currents of maltreatment that sometimes go unnoticed, even by the victims themselves, until it is too late. Foster, the fostering and enhancement of an atmosphere of intimidation, fear, and instability. This is often viewed as the most dangerous type of abuse. The reason is because you take a totally sane person, right? Enter narcissist who turns him into some crazy, mad, doesn't even, you don't even know yourself anymore, right? I used to look in the mirror and I had no clue who that woman was staring back at me. This goes along with the normalizing that we talked about yesterday where you're in a relationship. I can't tell you every single woman I've spoken to has this experience, whether you've been in it for a year or you've been in it for 35 years, right? Is that you look when you're finally looking back and you're like, holy shit, uh, look, look at the transition of who I was at the beginning and then what I became at the end and I don't even know who that is. So, so for example, um, the, re the result of ambient abuse, which is, so, so the narcissist creates this, this atmosphere in the relationship where a victim is, lives in, um, in some, some, to some degree of fear, whether it's fear that, um, I mean, the worst obvious kind of fear is physical violence, right? Um, but most often in um, the, the kind of fear is that they're going to retaliate in some way. Maybe they're going to give you the silent treatment. Maybe they're going to verbally abuse you. Maybe they're going to just get angry. And, you know, if, if, uh, if you're like me who grew up in a household where you did not want to poke the bear, who was my father, you know what I mean? Or all hell was going to break loose. He used to turn so red that I thought his eyes were going to pop out from the pressure. So that's the kind of fear that gets instilled is like, uh, over the years, I was afraid to just approach him and it was, I wasn't afraid, you know, it wasn't going to hit me or anything. Sometimes I was just afraid of him, just of the glare or the, I, I just didn't know what was coming, but I knew something was coming. I knew some kind of punishment, whether he was going to insult me or humiliate me or I don't know, something was coming. So just that, just that, so, so living under that fear of, you know, uh, just, just like treading water, right? Like walking on eggshells. That's the best way to describe it. Um, and, and so, for example, I, and this was a slow progression over 16 years for me, um, but one of the examples, I want to make sure I'm not, because yesterday my thing wasn't scrolling and I missed some questions. Um, uh, yes, I will get back to that, um, Natalie, about, she was asking what I was talking about in the beginning about telling your story, right? Um, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. That's what I decided. I didn't decide it right now, but you just reminded me. We're going to talk about that tomorrow, keeping secrets and how to tell your story and, and what all the threats that they make when you, when you do that. Okay, let's get back to. So ambient abuse. So creating this um, atmosphere. So on the outside, now you have to understand in any abusive relationship, even a physically abusive relationship where like neighbors are seeing bruises on, on somebody, right? Uh, on the woman. It's like, in a, in a, but especially in an emotional, uh, in a narcissistic abuse, abusive relationship, is that from the outside, you have both abuser, both narcissist and victim putting out the charade. I know that sounds crazy because you would think, why would the victim do that, right? If Why wouldn't she like shout it to the heavens and say, hey, and no, 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 you can't do that because you've spent all that time already when the narcissist was really great in the beginning and love bombing you, telling everybody how great he is, right? And telling everybody how great your life is. And also you don't understand what's happening to you, right? You just, you, you think you're the one with the problem. So why would you go tell anybody that you're the one with the problem? 
So both of you on the outside are keeping up this charade. So if you would have been on the outside and some of you who know me from this time, who are still follow me on Facebook and from the town that I used to live in, um, this is what you saw. And I worked very hard on the, on the outward appearance, right? Now, this is not to say at the time I was incredibly happy sometimes. In the beginning, most of the time. And then as years went by, some of the time. And then as years went by, not much of the time. And then at the end, never, okay? So in the beginning, when this all started with my happiness and having found the love of my life and we created a family and businesses and a life and all that stuff. So I worked really hard at not letting anybody see behind the scenes because I didn't want to, I didn't want to stir the pot. I didn't want to cause trouble. I loved, you know, this man. Um, I didn't want to cause trouble for him. Um, there were, I just kept, you know, I just kept it all to myself now behind the scenes. So outside it was like, wow, look at them. You know, they were the couple, you know, they're the couple who has it all. They're like, look how happy they are together. And they, they've got great kids and everything was picture perfect inside, right behind the closed doors. There were, this is, this was what I lived with. Okay, because I'm walking on those eggshells. So from one moment, I'm feeling really empowered and I'm like, I'm going to speak my mind and I'm going to get what I want in life. I'm going to do it right. And I'm like, okay, great. And then the next moment, boom, it's like, no, you're not, honey. No, you're not. So, for example, uh, of ambient abuse. So, so one of the examples I can give you to show you how uh non-exciting it is like right it's not like it's not like you see on tv like the um domestic violence it even has the word violence in it right the the violence most often is inside it's it the violence is going on inside of us of our minds of our hearts of our bodies um yes somebody is saying that they have a chronic illness that comes directly from the stress right? That, that is caused by, so yes. So this violence is going on inside. So, so when I tell you this story, you're going to be like, that's really boring. Don't you have something more exciting to tell me? So after I had, um, okay, I tell two stories, quick stories, promise. So after I gave birth to my second son, um, and before him, I had had a miscarriage. So it was traumatic time, had my second son, he was my rainbow baby, still is, he's 18 now. Um, and then after that, um, my husband at the time was like, I want it. he loved me pregnant. At the time I thought, oh wow, this is so awesome because I just must be so beautiful pregnant and I'm just gonna have babies and that's, you know, no. He loved me pregnant because being pregnant and after giving birth is I was in a very weakened state. I'm in much more of a woman pregnant is in a much more helpless state, right? We're in a more dependent state. Anyway, I didn't know any of this at the time. So he was like, you know, soon after our son was like, you know, I don't know, six months old or whatever. He's already, let's, you know, I want to have another baby. I want to have another baby. I want to have another. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to because I was just starting my um, writing career. Well, I wasn't, I was trying to, okay. And, um, I had written a book that I was, you know, going to writers conferences and I was meeting with agents and, you know, I was trying to do all this in between taking care of babies and, and my other son and, um, and running our businesses and all of that. So, but my big dream was always to be a writer. So I kept telling him, I'm like, no, I don't, I, I want to focus on this because I already have a baby and I just want to focus on, you know, doing more of this. So he told me, he promised, he said, you know what? I've always, and he, he had said this for a while, like from, from the beginning, he had always dreamed about being a stay at home dad. He thought that that was you know, he was going to do that. He really wanted to do that because he was tired of working so hard. So he was a workaholic. 
tired of working and it would be so nice if, you know, and he made it sound like, okay, Susanna, you stood behind me while we started our businesses and, and you got behind me and made the sacrifices and stayed home and whatever else so, so I could get to this point in my business, in our business. So now it's my turn. I'll be a stay-at-home dad. Um, after once, you know, when you have our baby, this is how he's convincing me to get pregnant again. So when you have our baby, um, you just let me know. You just tell me. Okay, right. I'm gonna. Um, okay, I'll be a stay-at-home dad now, and I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do what you do. We're just gonna switch. So I was convinced, right? Because I'm like, that sounds that sounds great. Uh, okay, flash forward. So I get pregnant. I, I got pre I get pregnant. I got pregnant really easy. Um, and really quickly. And so even though I didn't want to, um, I have our third son. My love dearly. Don't, you know, this isn't about would I change anything. Um, and uh, our son, our, our youngest, my third son had tons of um, health problems when he was born. So at two months, um, he had emerging life-saving emergency surgery. I won't go into details, but anyway, it was, we weren't sure if he was going to make it. This is at two months. In addition to that, I had the worst postpartum depression. I had it with my firstborn, but it was, it was mild. I didn't have it with my second, with my third, maybe because I was an older mother. I don't know. I was like 35, I think, but it hit me like a ton of bricks. It was horrible. Um, and so around three months, so we passed the health crisis, right? Got it through that. Um, I was still suffering from depression. Um, after, uh, at, uh, during that time, he not only went back to work, but he was working. I, I'm saying this literally. I'm not making, I'm not exaggerating this. He worked seven days a week from sun up. When the sun came up, he left. When the sun went down, he came home for dinner, and then an hour later, he went back out to teach until 10 o'clock at night. Seven days a week, he was not there. So me, postpartum depression, three kids, one baby, one toddler. It was not pretty. Um, so I went to him, and I said, um, I said, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. This, I need this. I need this to save my life because I, I feel like I'm dying here, right? And um, and this is how quickly it was over. I remember exactly where he was sitting on the counter in the kitchen. I remember it as clear as day as if it happened yesterday. I said, okay, babe, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready to trade places. And he said, and he had that narcissist glare. I didn't know what it was at the time, but the black eyes and just cold as ice, like a, like a, like a, like a, a switch. It's just switched off or something. Somebody switches, a, a flips the switch in, in him. Um, and he just said, mm, yeah, no, I decided that I don't want to be a stay-at-home dad. And that was it. He got up and he went back to work. And that was it. Um, these, these on the outside don't seem like, you know, earth-shattering um, moments. But when these kind of moments happen time and time again, what it does is it sets a victim up to be dependent, to be, to live in, uh, to walk on eggshells, to not know what's going on, right? To not, like at the time, that taught me that, okay, now I don't really know anything. I don't trust anything. I don't know if ever he says anything, if he's going to follow, the, you know, it, it sets the stage. Likewise, during that same time, one of the things that, because again, he's working seven days a week, right? Sometimes he would stay home for a few hours on Sunday. So I had asked him, because I hadn't been to the dentist in a really long time. And I said, hey, I was wondering if I could go to the dentist this week or any week and get my teeth cleaned right? Because it had been a long time. And he told me, and I had, you know, baby, toddler, uh, nine-year-old or 10-year-old. Um, 
And he just told me, and it was just quick like this, you know, just super quick. And he's like, you know what, Susanna, I have to work. He could have easily taken time off. I mean, we have ran our own businesses, so give me a break. He said, every other American mother, every other mother in America can figure this out, this child raising thing. So why can't you? Like, figure it out. So I was like, okay, how can I do this? Okay, to get my teeth clean, can I put Enrique in the, I could, if he was in the chair, the rocky chair, I could like, you know, rock him with my foot. And then I could, um, we didn't have, you know, anything electronic back then um, to give to the kids. So it's like, and my, you know, two and a half year old or three year old could, uh, maybe I could ask the secretary out front to watch him. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the fact is I didn't go to the dentist for two years because of that. This is ambient abuse, people, right? It seems like little stuff, but it's just the narcissist way to slowly and surely over time get you into a position really the for the main purpose of you continue to allow them to continue their abuse, right? They get more in control, you get more powerless. Um, that's the game. That's 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 the bottom line. Uh, I wanna make sure I haven't missed any. Um, you can ask me any questions you want. I promise, I'll, I, I answer everything. Like there's no secret I won't, I mean except about my kids, of course. I keep their secrets for now. But when they grow up, I'm throwing it all back in their face, for sure. Okay, the silent treatment. I know a lot of you have, ugh, the silent treatment. I will say, I didn't know what it was at the time it was going on. Looking back of all the things, of the cheating, the lying, the smear campaign, everything, I would say that the, the, the one thing, the one tactic that he used to just destroy me was the silent treatment. This goes way beyond, I wanna, I wanna differentiate between, you know, let's say two healthy people, that's not a narcissist, so two healthy people have a fight, right? And one's like, okay, look, I need to go cool off, or I don't wanna talk to you right now, right? I need a break. That's not the silent treatment. That's just, we get pissed off and that makes sense, that we're like, stop pissing me off, I do, mm, don't talk. That's totally different. The silent treatment is, a, is an intense, it, narcissists use it intently and purposefully to punish you for whatever it is that you did. So, you know, Usually if, if like you, I don't know, you argue with them, you talk back to them, you call them on something, like it's crazy with narcissists. You can't even call them on their own bullshit. They'll punish you for it, right? Because you're just supposed to sit there and suck it up and take it, woman. Shut up. So I would get, and the silent treatment really just got, that was a, that was a common thing the past, especially like the past two years of my marriage where it was, because we lived, we had built this house together, this ginormous house. It was 10,000 square feet on 10 acres. It's beautiful. We built it together. We planned it all. We did, yeah. Um, it was the big house that I was alone in, right? Like all the time. And in the winter in Wyoming, and I'm an Arizona girl, my God, I felt like I was in a Dr. Chivago movie. It was horrible. I was just, I was, I was not only alone, I was cold. Anyway, the silent treatment, he would just, to punish me, he would just, it, it's not just not talking to somebody, right? It is, and it's not even ignoring because, I mean, it is ignoring, but it's on, but it's on like ignoring on crack because like if you just want to ignore somebody, you're just like, I don't know. Who are, what, what, I don't see you, right? Like, I'm ignoring you, right? This is, he, it, it's not like he avoided me. 
he would come home and I always he'd come home around six ish right before dinner. I always had dinner. I love to cook. I'd always have dinner made for him and our kids. So he would come home and during the day he wouldn't um, call me or text me. Usually from work, he would check in once in a while or maybe ask me to lunch or whatever. No, not during the silent treatment. Nothing. I wouldn't hear from him. So he'd come home, eat at the. Oh, wait, it's paused. Hold on, can anybody still see me? It's saying that. My videos, I'm going to ask in the chat. Can you guys still hear me? Okay, you're saying yes. Okay, it's saying trying to reconnect. It says my video has been paused. Okay. Shoot. Yes, you can hear me. Okay, I'm going to keep talking even though it says that my video has been paused. Um, okay, so back to, so yeah, like sit at the dinner table, eat the food I had made, talk to the kids like, like nothing's wrong, right? Just like normal. And just not look at me, just, you know, totally ignore me. I cannot tell you how many times, and this, this is where... Um, uh, I could I, I try not to beat myself up over things that I did but the one thing about staying too long because of my kids that's still I still carry that burden anyway um, at the dinner table I would try to be holding it in right and I would get tears in my eyes and and I would try to be strong and once in a while my son Antonio who's only like I don't even know younger than 10, probably like eight years old, and he would reach under the table and just like pat my hand or whatever, you know, because I wouldn't outward cry, I wouldn't do anything. I just, I was just so in such distress. Um, okay, great, I'm glad you can still hear and see me because it's still saying that it's pause um, and that I have poor connection, which is stupid. Um, that's the silent treatment. He would, and usually it lasted around three days until I actually would go to him. Um, next morning, he would, and like going to bed at night, it's just, it was just like he was going through what all he usually does, like his mood hadn't changed or anything. It's just, I didn't exist, right? So he just walked around me like I was a piece of furniture. Uh, sometimes I would be in my bedroom and he wasn't in there. I would go in there into my closet to cry and he would come in and literally like just walk around me and go get his, you know, to change his clothes or whatever. So the silent treatment sucks. It's so painful. And let me just use this to say that because I had a woman ask me this morning, do they do it on purpose? Fuck yeah, they do it on purpose. They do all of this on purpose, okay? A healthy, loving person, this is not real love, right? Like, they, they, no healthy, loving person would ever do this. Okay. Let's talk about, if anybody has any um, comments or questions on silent treatment, I'm going to scroll again, make sure. Um, okay, good. Um, I'm wondering why it's saying my video has been paused. Okay, if you can hear me, I trust you. Let's talk about projection. This can actually, projection can be your friend, if you know what it is, right? It can be your friend, not only with your ex or whoever you're trying, with anybody, with any asshole you can, that's, projecting shit onto you, you can just like bat it right back there, right? Um, okay, projection. I'm going to read you my definition. A psychological defense mechanism where a person, narcissist, 
projects their own undesirable thoughts, feelings, or actions onto someone else in order to seek acquittal from their own conscience. For example, accusing the victim of cheating when the accuser is actually the one cheating. I know y'all have had people do this to you where, and I spent years defending myself to the narcissist or whatever we're gonna call them. I still don't have a name. Sometimes I call him Vader, but then I think that's an insult to Darth Vader. Anyway, projection. The, the most common way to, that, that you see it happening is when the narcissist accuses you of cheating, of lying to them, of, um, of bullying them, accuses you of being the narcissist, right? That's all projection. So everything that they are, they're, 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 they're assuming that you're the same, okay? So, um, and if somebody could just check in and make sure that you guys can still see me, that my, that my internet connection is still good. Otherwise, I'll, I'll I don't know what I'll do. Um, if somebody could put just a yes in the comments that... My video has not been paused because I can start it again. I can start the. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Annette. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, projection. So, how can this be your tool? First of all, projection, if you don't know what it is, and this is why it's so great to empower yourself by learning these terms is that it can drive you up a freaking wall and you're gonna waste a lot of time and energy defending yourself all the time, right? So I did, I constantly defended myself. One of the favorite things that like, especially toward the end, I wasn't allowed to go out that much. Um, so about once a month, I got to go to dinner with my two friends. It's about every month. But I had to do a whole thing, like make sure dinner was ready and he could just, just so he could walk in and like not do anything, just so I could go out to dinner for a couple hours. Anyway, upon my arrival home, every single night, no matter how late I stayed out, you know, he's always waiting up for me. And he just wanted to know, which is, which is really weird if you think about it, but he just wanted to know, what did, I, what did we talk about? Did we talk about him? What do we say? And I thought, and I remember always defending myself like, no, seriously, we, we didn't talk about you. Or even if we did talk about you, there's, well, I'm not going to fucking tell you. Um, but it was always like, like when I went to my, um, was that my 20th high school reunion? I think so. Um, when I got back and I was allowed to go to my, high school reunion, right? And I love my high school reunions because it's always me and my best girlfriends from high school. Like we go without husbands and without, we just go as a group. We've always done that to, to all the reunions. And it's fantastic to get back with the girls because it's just like it was in 1986. Anyway, so I get back and you know, that's, oh my God, the inquisition was just lasted for days, you know? Did I see my old boyfriends? Did I, did I screw around with any of my boyfriends? Did I, was I flirting? Did I cheat? Did I, what, you know, it's just on and on and on and on. So at the time I had no clue. I was like, um, what, I would just defend myself. Cause I'm like, no, I'm not cheating. I'm not doing anything. I just had a great time with my girlfriends, right? Um, I'm just reading comments, yes, yeah, so I don't so I don't miss anything. Um, my mom says the video is paused. Okay, is it paused now? I'm gonna ask again. I'm asking. I don't know what's wrong with the stupid internet. It says that I have internet. 
I don't know what's what's up. It does it says Okay, yay, back on. Are we back on? What the hell is going on? <sighs> I don't know how to fix these things. My eight year old knows how to fix these things. He's not here. He can't help me. Um, okay, so projection. So I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to wrap this up so that, um, so in case it pauses, whatever. Um, I want to finish with projection. Here's how you can use it to your favor now that you know what it is. Everything that a narcissist is projecting on you is what they're doing. Period. That's how you know. You want to know if they're cheating? If they accuse you of cheating, they're cheating. Right? If they accuse you of lying, they're lying. It's that simple. Right? Because think about it. Would you, would you do that to them? Would you do that to somebody? You know, be like, that's what they're doing. Right? So they do it so that they can clear their conscience. Um, you know, so when they're cheating, they want to pin it on you that you're cheating so they can feel better about themselves. Right? Uh, or maybe that you deserved it. Um, okay, good. It's still, it's still on. And okay, we're, we're, we're doing this even though... <laughs> I don't know what's going on. If I'm talking this whole time, that's fine. It's fine. Um, maybe it won't be record. I don't know if this, like, I can't, see, I just see a screen that says my video has been paused. Okay, so we, you know, as usual, I go over the 30 minutes. That's to be expected. I love being here and talking to all of you. Tomorrow, um, we're going to talk about that too. Somebody wrote, he doesn't tell, you know, doesn't project on her. He goes around telling everyone else this about. So that is the smear campaign. That's going to be a topic too. Tomorrow, um, around the same time, um, we're, the topic's going to be keeping the secrets. Okay. So come tomorrow with questions as far as, you know, cause, cause that's a big thing as far as, who do you tell? When can you tell? Can you tell your story? Can you share your story? Answer, fuck yeah, you can. Quick answer. Um, but but all, and, and what keeping secrets does to you and how you're only benefiting your abuser or the narcissist. So, um, okay, that's tomorrow's topic. I'm so excited. Today's day five, tomorrow's day six, my 30 days. And I'm truly loving this. <sighs> Uh, go to my website, SusannaQuintana.com, to get a free copy of my new book, You're Still That Girl. Uh, again, just ebook now, but I'm going to have hard copies soon, and it'll be in bookstores next year. Yay! I'll be in Barnes & Noble. That's going to be so awesome. Um, uh, uh, oh, I opened up because I was filling up my schedule with those who want to take advantage of a complimentary call with me. Call me up, share your story, let's chat. I'm here for you. You're not alone. Oh, I'm going to put that. Um, anyway, I opened up some spots um, in my schedule for next Friday, and I think there's a couple still during the week. I'm going to put the scheduler right here in the comments. And then I'm also going to put the event schedule. Oh, I'm getting quick at this. I'm putting in the event schedule now for, um, that's on Eventbrite for Chris Godinez and I. We travel around the country talking to intimate groups of, small groups of people, um, all about answering all your questions about narcissistic abuse, no matter what the relationship is, parent, spouse, friend, boss, whatever. Not animal, because your dogs are, they're never, your dogs are just all perfect. Um, okay, so we'll be in Reno next, I think September 13th. Just check the event schedule, and um, 
And again, reach out to me. Uh, we're all on this journey together. I just happen to be farther down the path. So I have my PhD in hindsight of how to get out of it, how to recover, how to heal. Because um, you deserve, we all deserve so much better than that. No matter, and, and I want to tell you, no matter, because I talk to women sometimes who are, you know, I was 45 when I first got out of it, not knowing what I was ahead, what was ahead. I thought my life was over. I talked to women who are in their 50s and their 60s. It's never too late to get out of this and start living a life you deserve. So, uh, love and strength to all of you. Um, and I will see you tomorrow. Manana. Okay. Ciao.